Helen Garner, on my extreme right, author, of course, of The Spare Room, um, is going to talk to us about her experience of caring for her sister. Joel Nathan uh, is the founder of Life Goes On, and he's a survivor of not one, but at least two, I think, uh, life-threatening uh, illnesses, cancer and heart disease. So he's going to talk to us about his experiences. And Kathy Lee, who is a home hospice mentor and carer, who um, cared for her father, her mother, and her husband. And it was her experience of caring for her husband at home that brought her into the home hospice community uh, and, and made her into a mentor. So I guess that um, the purpose of the session is to give people who've cared for a loved one at the end of their life the opportunity to share their experiences and also for someone who's uh, experienced a terminal illness to talk about their experience. And I guess that picking up on something that, um, that we talked about this morning, which was love, I, I wanted to um, start with Helen and, and ask you to talk about your experience caring for your sister and about the role of love in that care. I'll start by saying that my sister w was a real pain in the ass as a person. I mean, before she got sick. And I loved her dearly, but she was a very, very difficult and prickly person. Extremely domineering and she had many qualities that made that <laughs> she'd also suffered uh, the loss of her husband uh, he drowned when they were away on holiday 10 years before she got sick and so she was full of anger and bitterness and rage about her lot in life now we I, I'm the eldest of six children and she was the next one down chronologically from me so we basically spent our childhood together but as grown-ups, we didn't really have much to do with each other. We disagreed on everything, and um, she married a rather glamorous surgeon and sort of disappeared into that kind of life, and, and I became a hippie and lived in, 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 you know, I knew a lot of druggies and deadbeats, and she didn't want to know about me. So, so for many years, we didn't really have much to do with each other except through the formal links of family, and we obviously often met at Christmas. And uh, I, I should also say she was really funny. She was a very funny person. So when we were together, we used to laugh a lot when we weren't fighting. So when, when it was found that she had um, a, a lung cancer, she had an adenocarcinoma and she, there was no point treating it. I mean, you couldn't treat it. And, and so we, all, everyone else, all her siblings' hearts collectively <laughs> fell down an elevator shaft because she was such a hard person to deal with. But I'm happy to report that something happened to her over that period. It took her about eight or nine months, I think, to die. And she died at home in her own bed. And we cared for her in relays. And something happened. Something sweetened in her. And so it became a joy to look after her. And towards the end of her life, when she couldn't get out of bed anymore, uh, for, for a while we knitted. We would knit a lot. She was a great knitter and she we just kind of pointlessly knitted squares. You know, they weren't <laughs> garments or anything. But but uh, whoever came would just pick up the needles and keep going where the uh, previous person had left off. And and we laughed a lot and, and just lay on the bed with her. And there was palliative care. Uh, this is in Melbourne. She lived in the suburb of Kew and there's a, a, a hospice called uh, Caritas Christi that's not far away and the, the palliative people were beyond fabulous. They were so sensible and, and pragmatic and undomineering and we loved them. And they talked blunt sense to us. They didn't try to soften the blow and she wasn't the... Actually, my sister, she had been a nurse. That was another great thing that she'd lived her whole married life and her professional life in a kind of Western medical situation. And she, um, she could talk to the doctor in those terms, to the, the oncologist. That was a great help to her. But, but the caring for her, uh, it turned out to be not very... You mentioned bodily fluids earlier, mm -hmm. which I thought was a very discreet way of raising that, the painful topic of basically shit and vomit, which, uh, I mean, those are things that people 
uh, it, uh, it's hard, in a way, it's harder to talk about cleaning up someone's shit than it is to talk about them dying. Mm. We're, we're, even in the way things are in our society today, we're still terribly squeamish about the things that we were taught to be squeamish about as children. But the, we didn't have great problems there, well, partly because we we're all, well, we only had one brother and he was a pretty menschy kind of guy. And uh, we, that was not, not a problem. Um, I'm not quite sure what to say about my sister. I, I felt that I deeply loved her and she was the person I was a child with. So we had things, we shared things that now no one else in the world except me knows are funny. I, I, there are some things that I, I can't put on a certain accent or walk in a certain way for a joke because no one's going to think it's funny. And I find that terribly painful actually. Did, did you know before you did it did you know that you were going to be up to the task or were you afraid in any way? Was there any dread? Yeah, I was afraid because I thought we were going to, it was going to be a, a horrible battle. I, some, excuse me, and I just mentioned my book and the whole business of Jenya. I, I wrote this book called The Spare Room, which some people might have read, and I, I did for three weeks look after an old friend. And that was just hell on wheels compared with looking after my sister because I tried to look after my friend alone. I didn't have any help. And, and there was a sh sh it was awful. But with my sister, there was a gang of us mm. and she had friends and somehow it was, we, we somehow organised it. It spontaneously became organised. My sister was a highly organised person, if, you know, in the bad and good senses of that. She was super bossy. And she'd say, you are going to take those wine racks. I don't want the wine, rack, the wine racks. Get them out of the house. I do not need wine racks anymore. Said, all right. And we'd take the <laughs> wine racks. But it was her sort of violent form of, of, of generosity. And <laughs> but, We're all going to use that phrase. Yeah. <laughs> but I've got the wine racks, you know, and every time I get a bottle of wine, I think, oh, Mari forced those wine racks on me. <laughs> but she... Yeah, it was, well, of course, towards the end it got a bit gruesome because she had, she had two children uh, and one of, and her daughter was really, took it badly and dealt, dealt with it. It was terribly painful. And so while my sister was actually in the actual throes of dying, you know, a few minutes before she died, her daughter was lying on the bed next to her, weeping in loud wails and cries in a way that I've never seen another person weep. And I, I, my sister was beyond responding. She was alive, but the, I mean, people do say that hearing is the last sense to go, and I don't know if that's really true. But I, I guess I wished that my niece, who I also love and who was suffering greatly, I wished that she could have been quiet, but why shouldn't she weep and wail? Her mother was going and her father was already dead, and who am I to tell her how she was going to to take it. So I, I, I somehow think my sister went out of this life with her daughter's wails and cries in her ears and I don't know if that means anything. I don't were, know what, were what you it means. prepared for the physiological changes that precede death? So did you know what a death rattle would sound like? Yeah, well, I knew what a death rattle was because both I'd been with, uh, just by chance I'd happened to be in the room when each of my parents died and so I knew what a death rattle was and I knew that you didn't have to panic when you heard a death rattle and I knew what it meant. So I, um, and my sister wasn't in pain, you know, she wasn't um, suffering in that way and the palliative people would just quietly come and sometimes we didn't even know they were in the room. They just one of them would just walk in quietly and just check out, just see. And then, and the one that came, the, the, she died in the middle of the night. And the the palliative woman who came said, just took me aside quietly and said, she'll die tonight. And I and I, you know, I wanted to go down on my knees to her with gratitude. It's hard to it's hard to express this huge emotional love and gratitude you feel for someone who's going to come into the room and be with you while the person you love and have fought with all your life is is dying just for someone to come and just you know she put a hand on your back and go please leave your hand there forever mm -hmm. just those simple kindnesses somebody was talking before about the idea of wanting to die at home being so that the person you love might be holding your hand and when I heard them say that I, I flashed on that experience on a few times in my life I've had a general anaesthetic and you know how you're lying mm. on the table and the nurse always takes your hand mm. and I think that's one of the most wonderfully comforting 
things in life. I often think of it. I mean, this nurse, I didn't know who she was. I didn't, hadn't noticed her face before or after. But just this hand, a firm hand, came and grabbed my hand. And I didn't care whose hand it was. It was just another person's. Helen, I'm just wondering whether, as a novelist who has obviously um, had to imagine many scenarios for, for many, many books, whether you could imagine then the scenario that you've just described with an absence of love. Could you imagine it being possible to care for someone if you either didn't love them or if, had, if you had some unresolved <laughs> issues around yeah. them. I mean, obviously, you and your sister, there was some, some push and pull, but yeah. there was love in the room. There yeah. was love there when it needed to be there. Yeah. Could you imagine a scenario where that was not the case? Yes, I can. Um, well, I also had terrible problems with my father mm. all, all through my life. I fought with my father. But he, when he was old, um, he lived, actually moved into the house next door to me. I had this little tiny cottage that's next door to my house and he was living alone in a flat in the city with no one looking after him. He too was a pain in the ass. But, and he was also <laughs> very funny. You know, he was a, he was a, a terrible... Ter I mean, I used to always used to say, you know, my father is the biggest problem of my life, but I adored him, and, but I was so angry with him and we fought and raged and everything was wrong. But in the, the two years that he lived next door to me before he died... All that just, and also my mother was dead, and I'm sure that's probably psychologically was the key to how something that changed between him and me, that everything just resolved all by itself. Mm. And I wonder if, I, I, I don't know about caring for someone intimately whom you hate or have terrible violent feelings towards, but I do know that some, when a person's, at, I was about to say, at your mercy, hmm. when the, you're the person standing up in the room, and the other person is the lying down one, is some, some tenderness grows in you, I think, even through anger. And I, I mean, as you can probably tell, I, ha you know, I have anger issues, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, but, but, but there are, uh, people get furious with you. Well, they get furious with you for being angry. You're not supposed to be angry. We're not allowed to be angry. And anger is bad, ipso facto, and I think that's ludicrous. But uh, and I would. <laughs> but um, but it is true that there's a, that, that when I was looking after my friend who died, uh, terrific rage occurred between us, and she was a very, um, in a lot of ways, a very highly evolved person, and she was a person of, of great sweetness, my friend, and and gentleness, but my God, she had she was a woman of steel underneath, I discovered, when our world views collapsed over her dying because she, was, she uh, was taken in by a terrible um, charlatan and paid lots of money to this shonky clinic and people who were, you know, pumping her full of vitamin C and putting her in ozone saunas and telling, not, not okay, an ozone sauna might be a really nice thing to do, but you should not be told that it's going to cure your terminal cancer. Mm. Um, but so we, we had terrible anger and yet somehow it, it was a struggle of world views I think between us and but I you know I loved her so much and I, I miss her every day and she knows she knew that I loved her and that's why she came to my house you know mm. and, yeah I don't know if I got off the track here. Uh, in, in movies we, we often see if we see a, a death scene some big conversation some reconciliation or some essential information has to be imparted in the last moment to give the actor something to do while they're dying. And I'm just wondering, um, <laughs> did, you, did you and your sister have any big conversations in, in those final moments? Or do you think no, big not conversations are... No, they were done with. We had a few final conversations that were... We just fleeted around it. You know, there were some things that you can never resolve, I think. And if you can accept that you can't resolve them and there's a great lump of stuff there that you're going to have to walk around forever, let it be what it is. I, I, think, you, I think some people feel that they have to... There are some things between people that can never be un, untied. And I, I think accepting that can sometimes be a huge relief mm. because otherwise you feel... 
you know how you, you hear people saying, oh, I know I'm not grieving properly because <laughs> X, Y, and Z. And, and that's so awful that there's this feeling, uh, a feeling that there's a, a right way to grieve. And if you're not grieving the right way, you're failing. It's like an exam that you have to do, a terrible oral exam without any preparation. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm going to come back to you All because right. there are many, many um, questions as a result of your story. But I, I'd like to ask you, Joel, now to tell us your story as someone who's beaten death, as it were, twice, but got very close to it, um, and how that experience prompted you to create an organization called Life Goes On. Well, at the risk of <clears throat> upping the ante, it's actually 10 times that I have faced wow. the Grim Reaper. <laughs> and here to tell the tale. You don't have to tell us all ten. It's okay. No, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I want to pick up on something that mm. Helen spoke about, which I, I feel quite strongly about. Um, and this is an observation. When you made the comment about your niece yes. lying with your sister, I think what's happened as part of this discussion on death and dying and this thing about grief and lamentation and mourning that all of those issues are forgotten. We're not, tra you know, it's, it's, if you look at any, and I come from Africa, where everything is celebrated in song. You know, when there's a marriage, they sing. When you die, you sing. When you're locked in jail, you sing, mm -hmm. as we used to. Um, that containment of expression, because this is the way it's supposed to be, you know, you're not supposed to ululate. You're not supposed to wail. Um, it all has to be prescribed and formal, and you will grieve for such a period of time, and, oh, dear, you know, so-and-so hasn't got over her grief. You know, move on. Um, I think this is part of the same conversation. You know, it, it's all prescribed. It's, it's almost like, you know, the, the, the medical roster. Um, but, you know, feeling and compassion are very much human to each of us. And unless we can actually express uh, how we really, really feel about things honestly and openly, which is why I think a forum like today is just fantastic, uh, to give people the opportunity to give voice to how they really feel. Um, I mean, there were times when, you know, when I was confronted by one situation or another that um, I was always being told, you know, you're not doing it by the book. Um, this shocked a lot of people. Um, what were you what, doing? Then? Yeah, I was just well, going to say, you see, were you not dying by the book? Are you literally. Well, I was supposed to die, you see. Ah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I decided I wasn't ready for that yet. So, um, but if we can't pick up something else that you spoke about, and I, I'm not speaking out of turn here, because if my wife was here, she would endorse this. Her mother, who was, and I'll use the word, she was a bitch, mm. second to none. Uh, to the extent that when I first met my, my current wife, um, uh, she'd said to me, um, I'd like to show you one of my paintings. And her mother said, oh, God, you're not going to pull that out. Um, and I said to her, why not? And she said, you're such an amateur, you know, you really are quite, you know, you have such airs about yourself. I must tell you, my wife's a very good artist. And... Um, she was horrible to her, absolutely horrible, and she never wasted an opportunity to criticize her for one thing or another. She developed Alzheimer's, she developed dementia, and she became dependent. Uh, my wife chose to give her and provide through the family 24 hours, seven days a week, nursing care. And I used to often say to her, why do you do this? You know, this is the woman that has never shown you any love, never shown you any affection. And she said, well, I'm not doing it for her, I'm doing it for me. Mm. And I thought, you know, this really touches at the point of why one cares for people too. Uh, because you, and the, the word was used often this morning, was the word guilt. Mm. Um, you know, you have to live with the consequences of whatever you do. And... Uh, and yes, you know, is, is it altruistic? Is it, you know, just because you're protecting yourself? I'm not sure, and maybe it's a bit of both. 
I think Simon Longstaff may have something to say about something about that later on when we when we come to the sort of ethical wrap up. So yeah. let's just get back to you for oh, a moment okay. um, <laughs> and and how your experiences of beating death not twice but ten oh. times um, got you to oh, to set up life goes on and what life goes on really does. Okay, well, there were two things that, that were transformative, and I'll pick up on the question you asked, Helen, again, uh, was the issue about love. Um, when I was probably, I think it was somewhere in the trajectory, I think at about the two-month mark after my first diagnosis, I had my first near-death experience, and I wrote about it, and it still sits with me over here today even, which was that... Um, I went down this tunnel of light and found myself floating on what I thought was a cloud, but who knows what. And I was infused, if I could use that word, with a sense of love. Um, And it, it wasn't a sort of physical pang of love, but an overwhelming flush. And I came back because I was told to come back. And I've kind of always felt that one of the great things that we need to do as humans in this life to express ourselves to our fellow man is to show love wherever we can uh, and to express it unreservedly. I'm told I'm a romantic and I don't care. Um, Because I think we all, we protect ourselves all the time against the fear of somebody thinking that you're a bit over the top maybe, but so what? I think we need to be as authentic as we really want to be. And so, from my point of view, the opportunity to kind of give something back. The story for me started with one patient that I was counselling who um, had a very rare form of cancer called leiomyosarcoma. And she was being pumped full of vitamin C by some fellow who was convinced that he could help her. I eventually got her to see a very good oncologist who was treating her fairly successfully. And she was getting past her emotional issues. She was married to a uh, very well-known television personality. uh, And she had all that kind of image stuff to deal with. And she was doing really well. And she'd come to me for about six months. And one morning, she came to the door. And she just burst into tears. And I said, what's the matter? And she said, I've just come from my naturopath who said to me, why don't you just confront your mortality? And she just crashed. Um, She never came back to see me again. She died three months later. And that was unexpected because she was actually doing really well. So I uh, decided that maybe I'd reached a burnout stage with listening to people's problems and... um, fortunately, was approached at that particular moment to join La Trobe University in their palliative care department, doing something that was pretty novel at the time, and I think still is, which is called health-promoting palliative care. And the whole concept being that all that holistic uh, input that you give to somebody at the end of life should start from the time of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. The challenge was the word palliative care, and that's been talked about Mm -hmm. this morning. Because the sign above the unit said palliative care unit. And every time we try to recruit anybody to come through in, into our studies, the number of people that would half step as they got and look up, and a number of them who said, oh, I don't think I can do this. And, you know, I've seen the problem all the way through on that, and it really is a word thing. So where do I begin? I, I went overseas, went to a conference in Paris, which was an international conference for cancer. And I was sitting, I always use this as an example because it really was a seminal turning point in my life. And the room was filled with, I think there were three Nobel laureates, top cancer specialists from all over the world. And they were talking as if the patient and the family were that water in that jug. We're going to cure cancer, we're going to prevent cancer, and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And I never once heard the word patient or carer or family member or the word love at all. And by the time I got back to Melbourne, I decided I was going to set up Life Goes On. Um, and I did. Um, and the whole idea was, and what we do is we recruit and train people um, 
who have survived or cared for somebody with a life-threatening illness. That's prerequisite number one. Prerequisite number two is you have to get through interview number one, two, and three. And then you come on the training program, and the percentage of people who get through the 90-hour training program is probably about 30%, because um, despite all that, they find the course too challenging. And I think that's good. Mm. Um, and those that come out the other end, we've had some volunteers who've been with us for almost 10 years now. And they love what they do because they feel that they're giving something back. But mostly they say to me, we actually quite feel quite guilty because we feel so good mm. Mm. about what we're doing. So I've set it up and we reach the whole of Australia it's a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week telephone counselling service. I want to ask you about the telephone element in, in a moment, but just to go back to the, the failure or success rate on the course, um, only 30% get through. What's the stumbling block in the process for most people? What's the bit that, that they just can't quite manage? Well, a lot of the time is we spend a lot of time talking about death and dying, and it gets to the point when suddenly it becomes a little too much for them. And for a lot of the people, it's unresolved issues from the past, and many of them going back to when they were kids. You know, the loss of a pet, for example. You know, we've had a number of people sort of think they were doing really well on the training program, and then suddenly we start to talk about, and something, as you mentioned, imagine the moment of your death. Picture that. Kind of like a stumbling block. The other one is, how do you handle a suicide call? Mm -hmm. Um, This causes all sorts of... Mm -hmm. Um, And then, of course, the the biggest single problem that we, we, why we tell people that, sorry, but you can't uh, can't carry on with the program, is the Mr. and the Mrs. Fixits, you know, who have an answer for everybody's problem. If you just do this, it'll be fine. If you just do that, it'll be fine. You say, your whole purpose is to actually be an ear Mm. and for you to offer people choices reflect back to them what their condition is and because of your experience and because of your training to be able to say maybe this room would look better if those flowers were put on that table um, kind of thing. Just picking up though on what Helen said so powerfully about that hand holding you know I'm going to take that home as such a powerful image and I think I think most of the room will. What can a telephone support service do when compared with that crucial gesture? I know it can reach out. You would be amazed at how your tone of voice uh, can be reassuring. You know, I once wrote one of my poems, ended up with, hope is the hand you hold on to when you walk down the road in the dark. And it doesn't have to be a physical hand. But I know what you mean, because the number of times I've had surgery and somebody's (laughs) held my hand and I thought... Somewhere else I wrote the thing. I think the, the loneliest act of all is to die alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to have a hand there for you at that moment, I think is the greatest gift that you can. I've mm-hmm. sat with many people who've died and, um, you know, even though they're not speaking and you just take the hand, there's a little bit of pressure and they know you're there. Mm-hmm. And that's just it's a really good feeling to know that you're there for someone. Mm-hmm. 